Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with CHP episode 162, Premier Joanne Lai, deuxième partie this time. Last time we convened, we looked at Joe's earliest years, growing up in Huai'an and Shenyang, later moving to Tianjin, and then on to Japan and France. This 11-year period, between 1913, when he started at Nankai Middle School in Tianjin, and when he returned to China from Europe in 1924 were Zhou Enlai's formative years. This is when he first embraced Marxism and committed himself to China's transformation under this system of government. May 4th, 1919 was a watershed moment for Zhou, like it was for so many. The CCP didn't exist yet, but thanks to the events and blowback from May 4th, it soon would. After returning from Japan... Zhou threw himself into his work as a student at the new Nankai University in Tianjin. You know how it is. Cream always rises to the top. Zhou acquired a reputation for getting results and was good at whatever he did. Communicating, organizing, and bringing people together. The summer of 1920, Zhou Enlai went to France, riding high on his reputation and achievements in Tianjin, Zhou took a leadership position as a point man in Europe, the ultimate cadre. This was his training ground for what followed. Whilst in France, he formally joined the CCP. Following the Third Party Congress, June 1923, 30 or so delegates representing a total CCP membership of 420 agreed to follow the dictates of the Comintern and join hand-in-hand with the KMT in a united front. Joe, recognizing an opportunity, perhaps, became a darling of the Nationalists, so appreciative of the good work he did for them, acting in the role of the perfect liaison, getting them established in Europe. This work led Joe to Sun Yat-sen, that led to Chiang Kai-shek, and Joe's posting at the Wampoa Military Academy as a vice director of the political training department. Seizing on this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, Joe used his time and his position at the Wampoa Military Academy to further the cause of the communists, both politically and militarily. Zhou and Jiang at this time were closely monitored by the agents of the Comintern, and these agents called all the shots at the academy. It didn't take long for the nationalists to feel like they were being diddled by the Soviets as far as allowing the communists to infiltrate the KMT like they were, recruiting people left and right. As I said in the last episode, of the three parties involved in this united front, only the Soviets believed this arrangement might work out. When things became a little too obvious, and after Sun Yat-sen died in May 1925, Chiang Kai-shek and his right-wing allies in the KMT decided to force the issue. And that's where we ended it last episode. The Zhongshan gunboat, or warship incident, of March 20th, 1926. The Zhongshan Jian Shi Jian, a mostly communist manned gunboat, sailed from Wampoa towards Guangzhou. Jiang pointed at this action and accused the communists of double-crossing and attempting to make a power play against the KMT by sending this warship to Guangzhou. Everyone knew this day was coming, but now that it had come, all the fractures in the United Front started to become more evident. So let's pick up and see what happened after that. All Zhou Enlai's lessons learned and life experiences faced as a youngster growing up in Huai'an, Shenyang, Tianjin, Japan, Europe, all of these events, all those contacts he made, everything was going to come in handy now. The Chinese Civil War doesn't officially start until many years later, but right about here is where the fuse got lit. From now on, Zhou Enlai is going to learn to become a master of disguise and an expert in passing secret messages and evading the military police. The next order of business that Chiang Kai-shek had to deal with was the Northern Expedition to get rid of the warlord armies. Wu Pei Fu, Sun Chuang Fang, Duan Qi Rei, Feng Yuxiang, Zhang Zuo Lin, all these guys. It was time to bring them down finally. Zhang still had a use for the CCP. He had a great idea to reinstate the dismissed 
left-wing and communist soldiers and use them in the front lines against the warlord armies. After cutting the communists down a few notches and later on kicking Wang Jingwei to Europe, Jiang was now ready to step up his agenda. Wang Jingwei was one of Sun Yat-sen's inner circle, and some felt the most suitable successor to carry Sun's mantle. Chiang Kai-shek had other plans, and marginalizing Wang and sending him to Europe was part of the grand scheme. Removing Wang Jingwei from China was Jiang's way of taking him out of the game. In July 1926, the Northern Expedition was launched. Zhou had been spending this time moving around and for the first time beginning to see the possible merits of Mao Zedong's ideas regarding the role of the peasantry. Their partnership had not been formed yet, but they certainly knew of each other and had met once before in Guangzhou. Mao totally disagreed with the Comintern policy and said in China's unique case, the revolution had to start in the countryside with the peasants. Zhou was now beginning to see the folly and blindly following these common turn agents. But as long as that was their only source of funding, they had to go along. And Joe became weary of them early on. You see, the Soviet way insisted that, at all costs, power must remain in the center. Having these rural, mobile bases out in the countryside, like Mao was talking about, went against this principle. Once Joe got settled in Shanghai, end of 1926. He was made secretary of the organization department, as well as a member of the military commission. Two armed uprisings organized by the CCP happened in Shanghai in October 1926 and February 1927. These were communist attempts targeted at the Shanghai establishment whose livelihoods were protected by the warlord Sun Chuangfang, he was too big a fish to take down. But the third attempt at upsetting warlord rule in Shanghai in March 1927 was effective enough to end in a decisive victory for the Chinese Communist Party forces. Zhou's role in these three uprisings was not a leading one. Nonetheless, especially in the final one that did the trick, he was heavily involved. He operated out of the French concession on Rue Lafayette, today's Fuxing Lu. He agitated and organized strikes mostly by forcing the Nanking warlord Sun Chuangfang and his army out of Shanghai. That opened the door for the National Revolutionary Army to march right in the next day. Another CCP luminary who worked with Zhou at this time was none other than Kang Sheng. We looked at Kang's life in CHP episode number 11. The communist forces, small as they may have been, did the job, not the NRA. Jiang's troops waltzed in when the job was already done. If the communists thought that they were going to get any credit for what they achieved, they were in for a disappointment. They let it be known that it should be okay for them to establish a Soviet government in Shanghai as a base of control. After what they did, showing they were no slouches and that they knew how to mobilize the workers too, it was not outrageous by any means to request this new kind of political arrangement. Well, Chen Duxiu, Zhou Enlai, and other leaders of the nascent communist movement were hoping for their own political representation. Instead, they got the Shanghai Massacre. Zhou had declared a provisional people's government in Shanghai just before Jiang marched in. This, of course, didn't go over well, especially after Zhou refused Jiang's demands to dismantle his government through the organizing genius of the communist cadres. Over 800,000 workers took to the streets and joined in on that third uprising on March 21st, 1927. Any political group that can mobilize that many people that fast could not be taken lightly. Similar strikes had also been organized in Wuhan and Tianjin. Not only the communists, but all these left-leaning KMT elements, radical students and workers, every last one of them needed to be dealt with if Jiang was going to tame Shanghai. Well, we covered the Shanghai Massacre in CHP episode 55. The communists were feeling a little bit too cocky after they proved their mettle in Shanghai. 
They had sent the warlord Sun Chuangfang packing, and now they made an attempt to consolidate their gains. Zhou Enlai and all the CCP leadership from Chen Duxiu down failed to see the strong arm of Chiang Kai-shek about to come down hard on them. It all started April 12th, when one of the top organizers in Shanghai, Wang Shouhua, was invited to dinner at Du Yuesheng's place. He, of course, is Big Ears Du, the top crime boss of Shanghai, who had a special relationship with Jiang Kai-shek. As soon as Wang Shouhua arrives at Du's spacious residence, he's strangled to death. Zhou is also set up for a similar fate, but after he shows up for dinner at his predetermined place of execution, he's arrested, but let go the next day. This was thanks to Zhao Shu. Zhao led Jiang Kai-shek's 26th army. He argued that murdering Zhou Enlai in this fashion would have been counterproductive. Zhou was, by this time, the top CCP operative in Shanghai, and too high-profile a person to be taken down so brazenly. Zhou barely got away that time. He had a lot of close calls that followed, but this was probably the closest he ever came to a career-ending incident. The Shanghai Massacre was carried out with deadly effectiveness. When Zhou tried to organize a protest against all the arrests of workers taking place, soldiers opened fire on them, killing and wounding hundreds. The manner in which the operation was carried out left no doubt in anyone's mind that this United Front, or First United Front, was over. And Soviet cooperation with the Guomindang? You'd forget about that, too. And with that, the Comintern lost a customer. Zhou escaped to Wuhan, had met with Wang Jingwei and Chen Duxiu, but to no avail. Ignoring the reality going on all around them, the Comintern was still dead set against any open conflict against Jiang. In the meantime, the nationalist government unleashed one heck of a reign of terror against all suspected communists and leftists. Jiang famously said back then, quote, better to slay a thousand innocent men than let one communist escape. End quote. And the Shanghai business community, who had the most to lose in upsetting the status quo, dutifully ponied up to pay their share of the operating expenses. They were quite thrilled that Jiang's men had cleaned up the city and put an end to all these strikes and workers agitating. After Jiang showed his hand, Zhou knew the only way to deal with the situation was going to be armed conflict. Mao felt the same way and had been saying this for a while. They argued constantly with the common turn agents who kept insisting they be cool, don't let things degrade to open conflict with the nationalists. Not yet, anyway. On April 28, 1927, even one of the most sacred cows, Li Dachao, the co-founder of the CCP, after taking refuge in the Soviet embassy in Beijing, was brazenly attacked and hanged on the orders of the warlord, Zhang Zuolin, Li Dachao was one of the more famous victims of the Shanghai Massacre and the White Terror that followed. Over the next 12 months, about 300,000 communists, suspected leftists, and who knows how many minnows who got caught up in the net will meet similar kinds of violent endings. So, no more pussyfooting around with this pretend united front. Everyone knew where everyone stood now. The Comintern and the KMT dissolved their partnership. The communists, however, Joe included, had not broken their ties to the Comintern. That tortured relationship still had a few years to go before it, too, got to be too much. As far as the Shanghai Massacre went, it was most effective. Jiang Kai-shek's intelligence was top-rate, and this alliance with Du Yuesheng was a masterstroke. The communist movement took a full punch to the face. Those who survived all scattered. The movement was driven underground and everyone waited for the party center to speak. The Central Committee held an emergency meeting. At this meeting, Zhou Enlai was appointed Secretary of the Front Committee in charge of operations. He was given a Ren Wu, a task to go to Nanchang in Jiangxi province and organize an uprising in defiance of this action by Jiang. To add some brawn and muscle in this planned Nanchang uprising, Zhou had around 20,000 troops, led by some 
Familiar names, Zhu De, He Long, Lin Biao, and Ye Ting. You can see how far back all these guys go. To make sure everything went according to the script, probably written somewhere in Moscow, they also had a Comintern agent working in consort. On July 25th, Zhou set out for Nanchang, arriving two days later. This was the next milestone in his personal history. Zhou believed in order for the movement to be taken seriously and to prove the communists were a contender to determine China's future, they had to take and hold a major city. Nanchang qualified as a major city. The future Marshal He Long was put in charge of the military planning. As always, the Comintern had their hand in everything. The operation was a success, and for a moment, the communists controlled Nanchang. But as soon as Jiang Kai-shek got wind of what was going on, troops were called in and made fast work of the gains made by He Long's army. By August 4th, they were shooed out of the city and forced to set up a base elsewhere. Zhou had already left Nanchang and was on his way to Guangdong. He'd later have to take the rap for this failure in Nanchang. Rather than stay and make an effort to hang on to what they had, Zhou had moved on to the next mission. So the Nanchang uprising looked promising at first, but thanks to planning mistakes and Murphy's Law, it ended up turning into a small disaster. On August 7, 1927, an important meeting was held that yielded some changes at the top of the CCP. Someone had to take the fall for that oversight of not seeing the Shanghai Massacre coming, and that turned out to be the top guy in the party, Chen Duxiu. He got the blame and was forced to resign. In his place came Chu Chiu Bai, a political and literary figure and colleague of Lu Xun and Mao Dun. Haven't gotten to him yet on the list of CHP topics. Uh, Mao Zedong got a dressing down at this meeting and was told to knock it off with his ultra-radical ideas out in the countryside. He was given the okay, however, to attempt a peasant insurrection, which will come to be known later on as the ill-fated Autumn Harvest Uprising, the Chosho Chi. Another thing to come out of this meeting was the agreement that henceforth the party should transform itself to a strong, secretive, and combative organization. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Here at this August 7th meeting, Joe was appointed head of the Organizational Bureau of the Standing Committee of the Politburo. This put him in charge of the organization, propaganda, military affairs, investigation, the Secret Service, communications, publications, and basically everything that was important. Zhou Wenlai isn't the top guy. He never will be, but he was pretty important. Zhou Wenlai was still leading the fight from Nanchang to Guangdong, but getting beaten up like crazy. This march from Nanchang to Guangdong with Zhou, Nie Rongzhen, Chen Yi, and Ye Ting encountered a number of things along the way that didn't go according to expectations. One thing was that they had counted on much more local peasant support along the way, but those famous fence-sitters from Chinese history didn't rise to the occasion. They were able to take Chao Shan, Chao Zhou and Shanto. But Zhou was a mouse fighting an elephant, and the troops he led faced heavy losses. They were down to no more than 800 men. Zhou contracted malaria. Nie Rongzhen, Xu Xiangqian, and Ye Ting personally arranged for Zhou to be transported to safety and treatment in Hong Kong. They sailed a small craft with barely enough room to stand. Two days later, communists met the vessel in Hong Kong waters, and Zhou was treated with quinine. By November, he recovered from another near-death experience and headed back to Shanghai. Ill-fated Guangzhou Commune, December 1927, that the Comintern duped the communists into doing, resulted in more than 5,000 deaths. Ye Ting, Ye Jianying, and Xu Xiangqian, believing this a suicide mission, took the city but could barely hold it for a few days before they had to head for the hills. Ye Ting had to take the blame, but everyone knew the Comintern was biting off more than it could chew with a place like Guangzhou. When it came time to think of a place to flee to safety, 
It was decided to head in the direction of Mao Zedong's safe haven on the Fujian-Jiangxi border at a place called Jinggangshan, a place mentioned in many episodes before. After the series of debacles and failed uprisings following the Shanghai Massacre, and with the ranks slimmed down to alarming levels, the communists needed to figure out what to do next. Jinggangshan is where Mao went after the autumn harvest uprising fell flat. Now everyone was either on the run or laying low until things cooled down. The next time something important went down was at the 6th CCP Congress, June 18th to July 11th, 1928. To ensure everyone's security, the meeting was held in Moscow, out of reach of Chiang Kai-shek's secret police. Zhou began heading up there in May 1928 with Deng Yingchao and wearing a disguise. He served as General Secretary of the Congress. There were 84 delegates and 34 alternates. Mao sat this one out. He remained behind in Jinggangshan. In Moscow, Zhou spoke up loud and clear as far as saying the fight needed to be taken to the countryside where the masses were. Whenever following the orders of the Comintern, the communist troops ended up walking into a buzzsaw with all these urban insurrections. They got lectured by Stalin, who was eager to assert as much control as possible over them. The new general secretary of the party was Xiang Zhongfa. Because of his background and worker credentials, he was a darling of the Soviets in the Comintern. He headed back to China after the Congress and began working on trying to revive the party and carry out their work. He tried to assert himself at once and began making various directives. His right-hand man was Li Li Sun. Li and Xiang totally rejected what Zhou and, of course, Mao had called for, giving up the fight in the cities and taking it to the countryside. Li Li Sun wanted all-out urban insurrection. This extreme talk was not what the Comintern wanted to hear. Xiang Zhongfa and Li Li Sun were telling the common turn to go to hell, and the Soviets saw everything beginning to unravel before their eyes. Xiang Zhongfa was a hothead, and not what you call someone who believed in coming to a consensus. Zhou Enlai was ranked lower than Xiang Zhongfa, but Xiang, being a worker, was not cut out for all the politics and day-to-day nitty-gritty of operations. So he sat back and let Zhou pretty much run things. This sort of made Zhou the top guy in the CCP. His main task for now was to revive the party in the areas where they had been decimated, expand the red bases, and build a red army. Stalin and the Comintern were still demanding their way as far as putting the focus on the cities rather than the countryside. Joe spent these years organizing, centralizing, and unifying the party and the manner in which the army was structured. He did this at a time when the KMT had quite a price on his head. But nonetheless, Joe threw all his energies into rebuilding the party after all this bad luck, failed uprisings, and misfortune. His rival inside the party at this time was Li Li Sun, who was still intent on defying the Comintern over the decision about how aggressively to take the fight to the KMT in the cities. By the way, during this period, Joe was able to keep in regular contact with Song Ching Ling, Madam Sun Yat-sen whose house was watched all the time by the secret police. But Joe used the services of New Zealand's own Rui Alley as an intermediary to pass messages back and forth. One thing to come out of this period was the establishment of the Zhongyang Teke, the Teke for short. This was the CCP's secret police and dirty trick squad. It also had a division, the Red Squad, that dealt in murder, assassination, and intimidation. Joe was the one who set it up and was in charge. In his management of the Teke, Joe and Lai was not such a nice guy. When the trigger needed to be pulled, Joe pressed it without a second thought. Assisting Joe with the Teke were two men. One was Xiang Zhongfa, the top party guy at this point, as well as a very colorful character named Gu Xunzhang. Gu was a highly ranked party operative and a Politburo alternate member. He was also well known amongst the criminal fringe and was a member of or had relations with the secret societies. 
Sometimes when a hit needed to be carried out, Gu would be called in to handle it personally. The early success of the Te Ke, especially in infiltrating Jiang's secret police, was legendary. Not only this, the entire KMT political organization from the top down was filled with spies and people on the Te Ke payroll. But the communists are going to take another left hook to the jaw in April 1931 when Gu Xunzheng fell into the hands of Jiang's secret police. The story went that Li Li San ordered a hit on Jiang Kai-shek and Gu was called in to do the job. Li Li San's ire over Jiang's encirclement and annihilation campaigns, which had already gotten underway, called for Gu to take Jiang out. Some sharp KMT Secret Service agent caught up with Gu in Hanko. Gu was living there under a fake name and was appearing as a juggler in some theater. He was recognized on April 24, 1931 and hauled to Nanjing. Someone as savvy as Gu Xunzhang knew he was screwed and that as soon as he got strapped down in a torture chamber, he'd crack in no time at all. So Gu decided to offer his full cooperation. The arresting officer was told by Gu not to send a cable to Jiang's office about his capture because it will get intercepted by communist spies operating right inside the Generalissimo's office. This officer thought that was all bluster and sent the message anyway. And sure enough, one of Zhou Enlai's spies, a confidential secretary to the director of the secret police, indeed intercepted the cable, knew right away what the score was, and leaked the details to people who got it to people who got it to Zhou Enlai. Then this highly placed secretary, knowing his days were numbered for tipping off the communists, slipped away into the night and disappeared. Joe barely had enough time to destroy what needed to be destroyed and got word out to whoever could be reached in the limited amount of time left before Gu potentially leaked everything to Jiang's secret police. Joe knew what was coming. Gu Xunzhang had the keys to the kingdom. He knew everything. All the secret codes, spies, informants, safe houses, and where everyone's secret hideout was. As soon as Gu began singing, everywhere, Wuhan, Tianjin, Shanghai, all the major nerve centers of the communist network, people got rounded up and killed. Joe got to as many as possible, but barely had enough time to save his own skin. By the time it was over, it was already being heralded in KMT circles as their greatest victory since the Shanghai Massacre and White Terror. Over 3,000 were arrested. Plenty of them got more than arrested, if you know what I mean. In June, Xiang Zhongfa, the top guy ignoring precautionary measures in the course of going to see his mistress one last time, got picked up and hustled away to his doom, but not before they extracted everything of use from him. He had been given away by Gu Xunzhang. Soon afterwards, Zhou's spies had gotten a hold of the transcripts of Xiang Zhongfa's interrogation. Xiang, like Gu, knew everything, and he told them everything. Gu Xunzhang had no choice but to throw his lot in with the KMT. Jiang let him live for a few years before he had him killed. As for Gu Xunzhang's family, Zhou Enlai, in his capacity as head of the Special Work Committee of the Central Committee, had Gu's family wiped out in retribution. On his orders, five assassins were sent out to do the job. Some accounts say 17 family and extended family members were killed. Some say as high as 30. However many it was, calling out a hit like this is not the kind of thing we would regularly associate with Zhou Enlai. With so much dissension at the top, the Soviets stepped in to demand a reshuffle of the leadership. They were able to get rid of Li Li San, and their new darling ended up being Wang Ming, leader of the so-called 28 Bolsheviks. Wang's number two was a man named Boku, and when Wang Ming, Stalin's man, went up to Moscow for discussions, he left Boku in charge. It was looking by the end of 1931 as if Chiang Kai-shek had a shot at stamping out the communists. Between the Shanghai Massacre, the Gu Xunzhang Affair, and the capture of Xiang Zhongfa, it was a massive body blow that drove the movement even deeper underground. 
By the end of 1931, amidst this internal struggle with the 28 Bolsheviks, Joe put on his disguise and headed towards the mountains of Jiangxi. Jiang had a hundred thousand silver dollar reward for the capture of Zhou Enlai. With one of the more incompetent and counterproductive Comintern agents running things, it was a difficult time for Joe. At a time when the KMT secret police was proving deadly effective, party unity in 1930, 31, 32 was at a low ebb, and the fight was on to revive the party and take control of it. Well, one of the direct results of this whole betrayal of the CCP at the hands of Gu Xuanzang and Xiang Zhongfa was that the whole Shanghai apparatus ended up getting shut down and transported to a town called Reichin, home of Mao Zedong's Chinese Soviet Republic, set up in November 1931. This is where the center of all things communist in China would be until the time came for the Long March. Mao's army in January 1929, had been successfully chased out of the cradle of the Chinese Revolution. Jing Gangshan, Jin was where they began to get set up next. Another thing that came out of the Gu Xuanzang affair was the rise of Dai Li to the head of military intelligence for Jiang Kai-shek. After Jiang learned how infected his intel service was with communist spies, he needed a new organization built from the ground up. This is when Dai Li enters the picture. He's a future CHP topic. China's Himmler. Rei Jin is located in southern Jiangxi on the Fujian border. Mao's base there served as a lone communist stronghold and covered about 19,000 square miles. Around 3 million people lived in and around the area. Although Mao was the top guy in the Soviet located in Rei Jin, Zhou Enlai outranked him overall, being a leader in the central party hierarchy. In 1930, after he arrived in Jin, Mao began cleaning up the ranks of the party through a number of vicious and violent purges. This was the first of many to follow in his lifetime. There had been obvious dissension in the ranks, and no one knew who was on whose side or who was a spy for who. The purges carried out by Mao at his base were so violent and so far-reaching, they came in for some heavy criticism later. The December 1930 to January 1931 Futian incident was a direct result of these purges. A Red Army battalion rose up in protest against the way Mao was handling things. Mao had to send Peng De Huai and Lin Biao to put down this mutiny. Mao had been the top guy in Jin, but after the arrival of the 28 Bolsheviks and those comrades who had escaped from Shanghai, his authority there was being challenged. This didn't do much to help the power struggle going on. Where did Zhou Enlai stand on all this? He didn't try and stop the purges. His greatest fear was infiltration by Jiang's KMT spies. Although Zhou felt the same way as far as rooting out the spies and anti-Bolshevik elements, he disagreed with the violence with which Mao carried out the purges. Plenty of innocent people got caught up in this. But these were hard and uncertain times for the communists. While these power struggles were going on between the 28 Bolsheviks and those lined up against them, Jiang was merciless in his attempts to shut down the base. After Zhou was selected by the Politburo to investigate the Futian incident, he concluded Mao was right to do what he did, going after perceived enemies of the party in such an aggressive manner. He cautioned about the excesses and said the number of anti-Bolsheviks was exaggerated. Out of these purges and struggles, the Red Army got shaved down to only a few thousand men, from what had once been 40,000. By January 1932, a resolution was passed that adopted all of Joe's findings, and once this was done, purge simmered down. This regime period is where Joe starts to gravitate towards Mao. Here is where he recognizes for the first time Mao had better ideas than the leaders married to the Comintern. They had met once before in Guangzhou, but had been separated since the Shanghai Massacre. Zhou had been driven underground in Shanghai, and Mao was out in the countryside around Jinggangshan. But in Jin, they came together, and from this point forward, they would remain together for the next four decades. 
By this time, no one needed to convince Joe and Lai that a strategy of focusing on the countryside versus the urban areas was the way to go. Mobile guerrilla warfare was the only way to stand up to Jiang's powerful army. Going head-to-head -head against Jiang and the cities had only produced one disastrous defeat after another. This urban strategy may have worked well in Russia, but it was wholly unsuitable for China. This issue continued to be debated internally as the top leaders jockeyed for a position, each pushing their own agenda about what to do. Mao had been calling for this strategy since his 1927 agrarian movement in Hunan. He was the lone dissenter back then saying, stop focusing on the cities. Start with the peasants and then work your way up. All these years, Mao had been considered sort of a troublemaker and a nutcase by the Soviets. But now, in Reijin, after all these defeats, more and more his strategy made sense. Zhou thought so. He came under a considerable amount of heat when he refused to attack Mao. The Soviet-led 28 Bolsheviks came down hard on Zhou for his support of Mao. In fact, when the watershed Ningdu Conference was held and it came time to decide what to do with the first field army, it was Zhou who was made the political commissar, not Mao. Ningdu was only about 90 minutes by car north of Beijing. There, in October 1932, the Ningdu Conference took place. Mao got his way in that his mobile guerrilla tactics were adopted, but to put him in his place, the leadership, led by Boku, relegated him to second fiddle. Everyone dumped on Mao at the Ningdu Conference, but when it came time for Zhou to speak, his criticism of Mao was watered down, and he fought for Mao. For his refusal to attack Mao, Joe had to take some heat. Boku called Joe a compromiser. We'll see later on. All those who lined up against Mao at Ningdu will, in time, get theirs after Mao rises to the top spot. All this time, Wang Ming, the titular head of the CCP, was up in Moscow trying to run things in China by remote control. Communications in the 1930s was hardly what it is today so it was hard enough to keep in contact using normal channels. To exacerbate matters, Jiang had been most successful in disrupting communication. It was nearly impossible to speak as one. Jiang had been launching, one after another, these annihilation campaigns. The only problem with these campaigns is that they didn't annihilate anyone. Jiang thought he'd finally dislodge the communists when he began the fourth annihilation campaign. 400,000 men set out in July 1932 to squash these communists. After a year of fighting, Jiang had to chalk up his fourth defeat. As his fourth campaign wound down, yet another Comintern agent came calling to Mao's Jiangxi Soviet. This time, Boku came arm in arm with Otto Braun, a German with a lot of energy and ideas, but little understanding of China. Brown was known as Li De. He was going to show these Chinese communists how to do things right. When Jiang decided to once and for all rid southern Jiangxi of these communists, it was up to Brown and Baoku to come up with a defensive plan. This fifth annihilation campaign is going to be the one that does the trick. This time, Jiang employed a new strategy that worked. When this fifth attempt got underway in early September 1933, Jiang's German advisors, Alexander von Holkenhausen and Hans von Siecht, had a plan. They adopted what was called a blockhouse strategy. This involved building these structures, these blockhouses that sealed off any escape route. At the same time, Jiang's forces of about a million men slowly encircled the Jiangxi Soviet area. Of the million men participating in this operation, the lion's share came from various local warlord armies. For their own selfish reasons, these warlords weren't so enthused about supporting Jiang, but they remained part of the campaign. In a word, the strategy was effective. It worked well, and for the rest of 1933, the Red Army suffered one defeat after another as the noose kept getting tighter and tighter around their base. 
Bogu's 28 Bolsheviks faction was not looking good. Four times before, Mao had been able to stymie Jiang's offensive. With this campaign to end all campaigns, Boku and Brown were getting clobbered. They were continuing to take orders from Wang Ming via telegram in Moscow. Many strategies proposed by Zhou were shouted down. Well, this fifth one worked. After four failures, Jiang was determined to prevail this time. He threw everything he had against the communists in southern Jiangxi. And that turned out to be all he needed to do. When the nationalist forces attacked Guangchang, the town just north of and considered the gateway to Reijin, it was time to evacuate. At this dark hour, all eyes turned to Zhou. Jiang was pounding them, and this new blockhouse strategy was unbeatable. They had to vacate the premises so they might live to fight another day. And they asked Zhou and Lai to come up with a plan. This plan became the long march, ultimately, but the most pressing issue was how to get out of Rei Jin alive. Zhou worked on this plan in conjunction with Boku and Brown. Zhou was given the portfolio of figuring out the actual logistics of the withdrawal. The planning was done in the utmost secrecy and was not revealed until the moment had come to evacuate. Zhou and Lai never liked to leave anything to chance. The evacuation called for a rump attachment to remain behind to slow down the advance sufficient enough to allow the main force of 84,000 or so to evacuate safely. Among those selected to remain behind were the sick and wounded and anyone deemed not fit enough to survive what most likely lay ahead. Bravely leading this 16,000 strong rear guard would be Xiang Ying, Chen Yi, Tan Zhen Lin, and Chu Chou Bai. 84,000. You could fill Stamford Bridge two times over. October 1934. In order to avoid getting chopped down by Jiang, they had to sneak through the mountains, sight unseen, a 10-kilometer long procession. Per Zhou's plan, they headed in the direction of He Long's army on the Hunan Hubei border region. That was the easy part. The hard part involved breaking through all these blockhouses that had been hastily built like a row of guard towers. There were four blockade lines they had to break through in order to be home free. Three were not terribly hard. The fourth one was the tough one. In order to get around this dilemma, Joe reached out to the local warlord in the area, Chen Ji Tang, and asked permission for their army to pass through. Chen Ji Tang, you might recall from those Morris Two Gun Cone episodes, Moisha worked for Chen Ji Tang for a stint. Chen was no great fan of Jiang Kai shek and therefore granted permission to Zhou's emissaries. Thanks to this bit of diplomacy, the Red Army had a safer route to evacuate. October 10, 1934. It had been exactly 23 years to the day since the Xinhai Revolution took place. Who knew back then that it would have come down to this? Zhou Enlai, though he didn't know it at the time, of course, started heading in the direction of Yan'an. He carried two blankets, one sheet, a sweatshirt, and some wrapped-up cloth to bunch up at night to use as a pillow. Who went where, when, which direction, all the codes, the entire plan was all Joe's. If things went well, he'd look like a hero. Unfortunately, as we all remember from previous episodes, things did not go so well. And Zhou will have to take his lumps for that later on. Deng Ying Chao left the same time as Zhou. If you can imagine, she had to make that daring escape sick to death with TB. Her mother, who was with her in Jin, was too sick to go on the march. When the Nationalist Army rolled in and started killing everyone, someone found out this was Zhou Enlai's mother-in-law. They were delighted. She got thrown into prison. Chu Chiu Bai didn't escape. They captured him. He was executed. And as I said, the evacuation didn't go as planned. By the time they reached the mighty Xiang River, Jiang's troops had finally caught up with them. It was a bloodbath. Of the 84 or so thousand troops, in no time at all, that number had been reduced to 30,000. And not just from battle. After seeing how futile the situation was, there were mass desertions. As soon as everything degraded to every man for himself, 
A lot of soldiers disappeared into the mountains and waited till the coast was clear. And then maybe they just found their way back to their village. As things went from bad to worse, Brown, who had been calling the shots militarily, started to lose his you-know-what. As his strategies led to one disastrous defeat after another, he began to take a step back and allow Joe to step forward and take a lead role. This is where Joe starts to work closer and closer with Mao. At this desperate hour, Mao stepped forward and said, this is what we got to do. Joe agreed. If they kept marching in the direction of He Long's base, Jiang would intercept them in West Hunan and they'd be finished. Mao had been the one to say, head to Guizhou. It was far enough away they could catch a breather there. Balku and Brown, of course, were dead set against it, but Zhou gave Mao his support. In the city of Liping, in Guizhou, where the province abuts Hunan and Guangxi, amidst this open split regarding what to do next, they held another meeting to discuss strategy. Mao was forceful in his insistence to head deeper into Guizhou. He said the nationalist troops there were two-gun soldiers, carrying a gun in one hand and an opium pipe in the other. This was also Miao country, where the Miao minority people lived. At this meeting, called by Zhou and Li Ping of the Central Committee and the MAC, the Military Affairs Committee, it was decided to follow Mao's plan. And Mao was merciless on how he wailed on Boku and Otto Brown. He held them primarily responsible for the lousy position they were in, much to the chagrin of Stalin and the Comintern. The 28 Bolsheviks with Wang Ming in Moscow and Boku in the trenches of Guizhou were being challenged for the leadership of the party. Mao said to start marching northwest in the direction of Zunyi. And it's in Zunyi where we will pick up next week. We could see in 1933-1934, Zhou began to recognize Mao as the best leader for the party. When everyone was dismissing Mao as crazy and too radical... Joe saw the wisdom and what he was calling for. And when it came time to decide, like right now, Joe Enlai threw his lot in with Mao Zedong. That made it much easier for Mao to do what he did next at the landmark Zunyi Conference. All for next time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from a relatively warm and sunny Los Angeles, California. More Joe Enlai next time. I guarantee it. Consider joining me then for... Perhaps another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.